praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. So, Amen. him 113. 13? 113. 113. Yeah. Can you wait? chapter 4 from the book Breaking the Worry Habit Forever. The title of the chapter is Do You Know Where Your Children Are? The ladies meet at 1 p.m. on Tuesdays in the adult Sunday school room. If you haven't come to this study um, <coughs> yet, we want to make sure that you um, are welcome and you can jump in at any time. <coughs> Men's Fellowship and Prayer Wednesdays at 6.30 a.m. also in the adult Sunday school room. Um, men, this is a great time for discussions. Um, as well, so if you're interested in other good discussions, join some fellow believers at 8 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays at the Cozy Corner here in St. Helens for breakfast study. Uh, Wednesday night study. We've started a new study based on the book by Jeff Vanderstelt called 180, A Return to Disciple Making. 
a lot of great discussions happening with this group. You're welcome to jump in at any time. This study is for everyone. Let us know if we can get the book for you, um, for you to read that goes along with the study. We'd love to have you come and join in the conversation. And today after church, we have cake. Nobody's as excited as Diabetic love cake. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, who doesn't love cake? I love cake. Right? Yeah. Um, to celebrate the May wedding anniversaries <clears throat> and birthdays, celebrating their wedding anniversary on May 28th is Brad and Teresa Pyle. <laughs> May birthdays include May 6th for Terry Taylor, May 13th, Nellie Kistner, and May 26th for David Fo Dan Fossey. Sorry. Columbia Pregnancy Center. Um, they're accepting donations for the community yard sale in Rainier, Oregon. Donations can be brought here or to the Pregnancy Center by the end of May. Also, the baby bottle fundraiser. Um, this, this year starts on um, next weekend, which is Mother's Day. It goes through Father's Day. Um, th those donation baby bottles are already out in the entryway if you want to pick one up early. Um, community meals. So this is kind of a big announcement. Um, so uh, we received an email from Kathy Bowska. Um, there has been some unfortunate water damage to the First Lutheran Church kitchen that has been discovered from a faulty sterilizer. Parts of the floor, subfloor, and cupboards will have to be replaced. The sterilizer must be repaired or a new one purchased. Um, the results of this disaster have rendered the Lutheran Church kitchen unusable for at least two to three weeks. Um, this affects those of us who volunteer um, there, but of course we're very sad about this disaster, especially when we see how many people enjoy and need these meals. Um, <clears throat> we'll put out the word as best we can, but please if you have neighbors or friends and yourselves that go, just kind of spread the word that for the next couple weeks they're not going to be able to serve um, the meals. And then they look forward to announcing a reopening as soon as possible. Uh, media devices, if you have a cell phone or other device that might make a merry noise, please mute or turn off at this time. We appreciate you and thank you very much. And let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for everyone in this room, Lord. I just pray that um, you reach each one with, with your personal <coughs> message for us today, Lord. And I just thank you for the opportunity to worship with a gr group of fellow believers. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now you can see the Alright, 2.36 at Calvary for those following along the hymnal. Verse 1, 2, and 4.
this is three verses. All three. Three verses. All three. All three verses. <laughs>
compassion and mercy follows us relentlessly. There is nowhere we can go to escape you, and there is nothing we can do that would scare you away. You are constantly inviting us to seek you and accept you. Thank you for never giving up on us. Today we want to pursue you, Lord. And Lord, we just pray that these tithes and offerings that are given today will just be used to your will, Lord, and to reach our community. In Jesus' name. song. I didn't realize you, put, you usually play something at the end of the service then, so I was expecting to down the top every time you hit it in the verse. <laughs> I really liked it though. <laughs> I found that out a lot when I was, uh, oh, let me get my thing back on. There we go. Now can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, I found that out a lot when we would do like, um, uh, at, at previous churches I, I would do an intro song sort of like we do here, but only be a snippet of the song, and I never knew where it would come from until I heard <laughs> the song on the radio one day. Um, I heard a really good story, and you're gonna like this story. Mm. When teaching children about world religions, a teacher asked her students to bring a symbol of their family, of their family faith to Christ, so like something of the, a symbol of what they believe in. So the next day, she asked each student to come forward and share the symbol with the class. So the first child said, well, I'm Muslim, and this is my prayer rug, and they went and described the prayer rug. The second child said, I'm Jewish, and this is my family's menorah. He even lit some candles to try to describe it. The third child said, I'm Roman Catholic, and this is my mom's rosary. It's kind of a neat, special thing to me to see this in this little story because I was uh, never met my birth mother, but my biological sister gave me my mom's rosary that she used to carry all the time. So it's kind of a neat thing. Uh, the fourth child said, "I'm a Greek Orthodox. Orthodox. I can never pronounce that right. <laughs> and this is my icon of my patron saint." And so the fifth child was brought up, and they were asked to show their thing, their symbol. And the child said, I'm a Nazarene. This is my casserole dish. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I can relate to that. Or as our cake. This is our cake. <laughs> I had to put that in there. I, it was true about the rosary. But no. um, as you guys know, last five weeks we've been talking about this Easter to Pentecost series of blessing our community. And each week with this series, um, I've been following along with some manuscripts that was suggested by the denomination itself. 
and I take those manuscripts and I allow the Holy Spirit to have me speak into them and not just read it verbatim or anything like that. Um, but I've realized there's a lot of this stuff that's been speaking me directly. And I've realized also it's very apparent in this series, it's almost like a pouring out. It's talking about us. It's talking about me and you pouring out ourselves. So it's meaning like um, that this is an important thing to do, that we are supposed to pour out ourselves. But other than last week where we briefly talked a little about about knowing our limits, there's not been much on how we actually get rest and get replenished and empowered. So basically, how do we care for ourselves as a church? And I believe balance is needed to not only bless our community, but how we can also take care of ourselves as well. So with the Holy Spirit's leading, um, we've got a couple more weeks of this series, but I'm hoping after that we can speak on us a bit. You know, uh, basically how we can lift each other up and we can be lifted up and encouraged and so forth um, after the series is over. I sat through many different sermon series where it seems like uh, uh, at the end of it, the pastor had to apologize because God, he goes, man, I really feel like I'm beating you guys up. So that's not the case. It's just I think this is the Holy Spirit that's kind of been flowing through things. One thing we commonly talk about is how the women study and the men study and the Wednesday night study and the songs, they all seem to come in and blend together and I believe that's the Holy Spirit. And so yeah. it's just also looking at ways to do something new that I might not even thought of. And boy, this is probably one of the most convicting uh, sermons that um, I've been working on out of this whole series for me. And I'll explain a little bit more about that at the end. Also, I hope my voice gives in. I don't have to do Avamir today. Every first Monday, the Presbyterian Church um, does the services, and then I do the rest of them. So I thought, oh, I'm just going to sing a little bit more than I normally do, because then I don't have to do another service. Well, all right, it's starting to give out. I'm going, uh-oh, I should have done that, right? You better go get vocal coach lessons. <laughs> but regarding this Blessing Our Community series, we began in week one, and we talked uh, through Mark 10 and uh, Matthew 28, and we spoke about how Jesus was the ultimate hero by not only being the servant example, but laying down his life for us. And in weeks two through five, we've been focusing on Luke 10 and Matthew 22, basically the story of the Good Samaritan. And many different aspects have been taken out of this particular series with that example. And so through the story so far, we've learned that we too can be a hero just like Jesus in our words and our actions. We need to love our neighbor with agape love as Pastor Laurie had spoken to you and explained about. And this is a love that shows empathy and it is intended for everybody. In week four, we discussed how every neighbor we connect with we should look upon with compassion and consider not so much who is our neighbor, but who we are being a neighbor to. And last week, we talked about putting our skin in the game, taking action, and what may need to be sacrificed to bless our neighbors. And so this week, we're going to be speaking on a scripture from Colossians 3.17, and we're going to see how much we may be making good excuses not to do some of the things to bless our community. Now, I'll be the first to say, I, as I mentioned already, I'm not good, or I'm good at making excuses, I should say. I'd venture to say that we all have good excuses that are, quite frankly, legitimate excuses. Um, like, for instance, I don't have liability insurance to drive that car, or I can't physically do that, or I need to be taught something before I do it, and I think those are good excuses. But then for me, I think of some of the excuses that I believe are not legitimate like, I'm too busy right now, or I never signed up for that. I've got laundry piled up at home right now. And I'll even add to that laundry thing. My son is doing his laundry. It's in the way of me doing my laundry right now. <laughs> because it is Sunday, it's time, it's 50's day, and I know my son has his laundry in the laundry room. So then I have to jump on him with love. <laughs> in some ways, the story of the Good Samaritan is a story about choices and excuses. And some things we want to do, there are some things we ought to do. And some things we ought to do, but we don't want to do. But isn't it true that when we don't want to do something that we ought to, we start looking for excuses? I know I do. Our primary scripture for the message, again, is Colossians 3.17. 
And, and this is what it reads. Word here. Uh, Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now, I believe this verse does suffice for what we are talking about today. However, when I was really looking at this, I believe that the preceding verse, verses to this um, speaks a lot about where our hearts and our minds should be. And the verses also speak to the many topics that we've reviewed and discussed in the last weeks as well. Um, so backing up to verse 12 in Colossians 3, 12 through 16. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone just as the Lord forgave you, so also you should, should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts. And then as I get to the end of that, that's where that verse 17 comes in. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God, the Father. Now, pausing at this particular verse for a minute, I was moved by the Holy Spirit to do a little bit of exegesis on this particular verse, a deep dive, basically, as it contextually relates to this particular message. Um, from the Wesleyan Bible Commentary, um, one of the authors is George Turner, and he mentioned how verse 17 is like a conclusion where the Apostle Paul had just listed the general exhortations in the preceding verses. And Paul gives criteria by which each word and deed can also be judged. Um, he basically says, can it be done in the name of Jesus? Can it be done with thanksgiving? Can it be done to the glory of God? Now, asking these questions is like a test, and it will settle many problems with reference to hesitating, doubt it, doubting, or dubious practices. And Turner also gave this story about Peter Cartwright, and he was a pioneer Methodist preacher who was asked to join a dance at a tavern in the town where he was spending the night. And so as Cartwright stepped into the floor, he told his partner he never did anything without praying for it first. I love this story. Yeah. And we were just talking about some other things this morning. <laughs> now, when he arrived to the dance, he dropped to his knees. And he prayed so effectively that the dance broke up and a revival resulted. <laughs> it was done in the name of Jesus. It was done in thanksgiving. And it was done to the glory of God. And that's why the revival broke out, I believe. John Nielsen in the Beacon Bible Commentary describes that at the beginning of verse 17, it says, whatever you do. Whatever you do is a summarizing principle in Christian ethics. Specific rules are minimal in the New Testament economy of grace, but personal and specific ethics must be arrived from principles and examples made known by Christ. He is no respecter of persons in this regard. Note the extent of this principle. It applies to every aspect of conduct, especially when we look at the words whatever and all in verse 17. And the word do indicates a settled course of action. So verse 17 also mentions in the name of the Lord Jesus. This provides the inspiration for all moral conduct. Now Paul in verse 17 continues with the reason of all of this, that only grace can make things possible in man who is naturally rebellious and grateful and the object of ethics. And by him, meaning by Jesus, it is Jesus who reveals the energy by which the Christian life is lived and the channel through whom all rises to the throne of the Father. So when we take the time to soak this scripture in then, we see how it contextually applies to 
our message today of blessing our community. And we can see how, yes, we are blessed. And yes, our neighbors are blessed. But it is all done in obedience and in the name of Jesus. When we look at the story of the Good Samaritan again, three characters are faced with the same situation that uh, places where we also may have been in our lives where we have made some excuses. They each see the victim. They each um, have the ability to respond to the victim. But from these three characters, Jesus taught us how to respond in love when facing a neighbor's unexpected needs. The priest was the first character to make an excuse that we talked about. Now, we're not sure what the excuse actually was because Jesus didn't offer that information. But apparently it was sufficient to justify not helping the victim and leaving the scene. Now, what are some possible excuses the priest may have had? What about, I'm too tired. I've been working hard for God all week. We can understand that excuse. We've all worked hard all week. Um, also, in another example would be if uh, you or I went to church all morning or we were working all day and then we had an extra meeting that lasted longer than normal. So we stayed late and we just got tired and we just wanted to get home. But suddenly on the way home, you see a traffic accident ahead of you. Should you stop and offer help or pass by or go home? You may have heard of the famous quote, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Now to some of you sports nuts, I'm not a sports nut, you might have recognized that quote from the late Vince Lombardi. Um, he said this quote, and since I'm not a sports nut, I had to research the guy a little bit, and he was a football coach and an executive in the NFL, and he was the coach responsible, I believe, for leading the first two Super Bowls uh, in victory, his team. And so when I look at the quote, though, fatigue makes cowards of us all, and I'm going, how dare you? <laughs> that quote offends me. But then I do a self-evaluation of myself, and I find times that more than not, I have made the excuse of not doing something for the stark fact of being too tired to do that something, whether it was something simple at home or even as much as passing by an incident alongside of the road. And I always think about this a lot when I, when I keep going. I, I, and we've mentioned these things in the past that, okay, well, somebody else is going to do it. Somebody else has already called this in, and I keep going. That's kind of an excuse I make. But then the Lord's been convicted me, especially this week, on the fact that, yeah, but you were trained for 13 years on how to deal with these kind of responses. Yeah. And you also know how sometimes people don't call as much as it's obvious and right there in front of your face. And so I was really convicted about that. Because sometimes it's, I'm in a rush or I'm too tired. That's usually what it is. I'm in a rush or I'm too tired. But how about this excuse for the priest? I can't become unclean by touching the unclean. If the priest becomes ceremonially unclean, he will not be able to do his priestly duties for seven days and will be required to go through the cleansing ritual as described in the Bible, which in Numbers 19, 11 through 12, that's basically what it talked about. They had to go through a process. Would it be a good excuse then for him not to respond? Could it have been possible for, at the very least, for the priest to get somebody to help? Somebody who could, yes, touch the bleeding man, but that person would also have to go through the same cleaning ritual. So again, does that person have obligations and a good excuse not to help as well? Because maybe he's rushing home to tend to his children um, and feed them for the day. So, a scripture in Luke, though, said that the man was half dead, the, the particular victim in this story. Taking the time to find somebody else to help in a spot uh, may mean that the man may die because he's already half dead. So if I'm going off to find other people to help, the help I might be able to give, that person may die. So what if the priest didn't make an excuse and considered what Jesus spoke about in Matthew 12? In Matthew 12, as usual, the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus and trap him uh, by quoting the law where his disciples were hungry and his disciples had picked grain from a field and ate them. The specific violation the Pharisees were upset about is that picking grains on the Sabbath was considered work 
And so if it was the Sabbath, it was a violation for working on the Sabbath by picking the grains. Jesus explained, however, in verse 8 of Matthew 12, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus also said in Matthew 12, 11 through 12, And he said to them, What man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will he not take hold of it and lift it out? How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it is, is it lawful? So then it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And I think about this a lot. I'm going, how much time do I think that I should be doing something because I need to be doing something else? And the priest, he made an excuse though. Whatever the excuse was, Jesus did not deem the excuses as being acceptable. Even though just Jesus didn't list out the excuse, he didn't believe that they were acceptable. Now the Levite, of course, was the next person who comes along, and you might think about, well, what is his excuses? Well, perhaps I'm too tired or I'm too busy or my family is wanting for me to come home. Some of the excuses that I've just talked about and done myself. But also, whatever the excuses of the Levite were, were unacceptable to Jesus. Now, there are no good excuses for not obeying God's call to help others. We are called to live for God's glory with an attitude of thanksgiving. May, making excuses not to obey obey is a form of idolatry and how I mean this is I'm like for me I'm making an idol out of my comfort and I'm putting that before obeying God and bringing him glory in our lives the Samaritan a man shunned by the Jews took the only acceptable action the Samaritan stopped what he was planning to do and took action to help the man without regard for whether he was tired, busy, or trying to keep his schedule. I know I bet we could come up with a lot of creative excuses for not helping uh, somebody in need today. Of course, we would not call them excuses, we would call them reasons. Now, what is the difference between a reason and an excuse? Well, a reason is what I come up with. An excuse is what you come up with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <we're... laughs> the actual difference has to do with our inner motivation. If our inner motivation is not to help, then we will look for an excuse to justify our not helping. However, if our inner motivation is to help, anything that restrains or hinders us from helping is a reason why we cannot help even though we want to. So an example, you might have a mother that has small children who comes up onto a wreck and to leave those children alone would be irresponsible or risky. That, that would be a good reason for a person not to be some, do something. But um, the thing is that it, it isn't wrong to be like that because Jesus honored the Samaritan for his action, for the things he could do. Jesus did not condemn the reasons of the priests or the Levite that, or anything that they might have had that was a reason. What Jesus condemned was whatever excuses the priest and Levite might have had. Jesus condemned whatever inner motivation the priest and Levite had because it was not indicative to a godly motivation. And I don't know about you, but I know that for me there are times when instead of coming up with excuses, I need to consider the possibilities. And one of those possibilities is to do what I or you can in the situation. Now, even if you can't do everything that's needed, just do what you can. Sometimes that means just picking up a phone. Sometimes that means praying at the moment. And even if the circumstances are not ideal, make the best of the situation and help as you can. Because you can recognize that divine providence has put you into the situation. Ask God what you are supposed to do. Maybe it's just to pray with or for a needy person. Now, an example that I've experienced as well, a lot of experience I've heard through medical and uh, law enforcement personnel over time is something like this where a woman happened upon a traffic accident in which a lady was pinned inside her vehicle and somebody already had called emergency services, so somebody did what they could to help. 
but the rescue workers were en route with a hydraulic tool that would bend the middle to take the, the lady out of the car. But before the rescue workers arrived, the woman held her hand, the victim, and prayed with the lady until she was freed from the vehicle. Looking back on the traumatic event, the lady that was penned reported how much she appreciated the emergency workers, but also greatly, greatly appreciated the unknown lady who held her hand and prayed with her because she called this lady an angel. And the reason why she did is because that lady at that particular time brought a need to her. She needed to feel comforted. She desperately needed that comfort at the time during that anxious moment. And sometimes all we can do is do what we can to help. Now, one thing I have to do is not make my plan an idol. I kind of talked about that earlier. We can make idols out of anything. We can make out an idol out, out of something good. You know, like planning. And planning is a good thing. Planning is the key to being more productive. But still, planning can become an idol. If we are unwilling to change our plans when divine providence directs, it's an idol. Whatever your plans are, recognize that God is Lord over your plans. If his divine providence places you in a new situation, your plans need to change to fit that new situation. Plans can be and must be altered to fit God's new direction. And I'm a deep planner, so I feel a little bit of anxiety when the plan doesn't seem to go my way. Especially when there's a lot of things that get interrupted. This week was another week of constant interruptions. And I feel, I feel like I catch myself acting like changing my plans is some great sacrifices. <laughs> and I've been convicted of it. And I realized that I was making my plans more important than obeying the second great commandment to love your neighbor as yourself. My um, daughter's other uh, mother, my uh, she calls her lovey aid, it's a term for grandma, um, is on hospice right now. And she wanted to go over to um, uh, see her mom, or see her grandmother, possibly for the last time. And at the very first inkling of being asked about this, because she asked in plenty of time, I thought, no, I just don't have the time to go over to Warm Springs and back. I mean, that's exactly what I, I thought, and I was convicted in that moment. And I'm going, well, what opportunities do I have to say to the same grandmother who I've known and respected all my life? And it turned into a witnessing moment of my former brother-in-law about talking, you know, he was very distraught. And I was talking about how you don't have to be so distraught because you can have hope that this lady knows Jesus. Amen. And she's going to go to go to a good place. Amen. And you can have that same hope. And I think about that now. I'm going, what if I decided not to go? Mm -hmm. At divine providence, I was stepping in the way of and making my own plans and time and idol in front of that. And so, if this is your tendency, write this down. God has permission to change my plans. <laughs> Vicki and I went through um, uh, this coaching class through, uh, it's called Marriage Team, uh, last year, and they have you post cards to help remind you of certain things. And so this is a good thing to do, and I think I'm gonna take this and do this this week. God has permission to change my plans and post it everywhere I can to see it. You might have the day all planned out, but God may have a different plan. You and I need to be ready to pivot if God presents a need that changes our plans. Providence is when God is at work through circumstances to guide us to a different plan. Now, don't get me wrong. It is important to meet obligations. It is important to remain also in the obligation of somebody else's plans, like being faithful in attendance on time for meetings, study groups, or whatever the case may be. Um, I have to keep an obligation to my school. Otherwise, there's a consequence of failing the class. If I'm not in there just one week, a certain amount of days, I can fail that whole class. And so maintaining these plans helps strengthen each other from a scriptural standpoint of these plans. For example, if I'm not attending the class, I'm going to make every effort to be on time as not doing so interrupts the class in many ways. A scriptural response to that would be Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads 
to poverty. However, as Christians, through grace, I as a student, whoever is leading a class or whatever the case may be, can know and understand there are important issues like stopping at a wreck or leading somebody to Jesus that supersede whatever the plan is at the time. Besides, in this day and age, everybody has a cell phone. It would just take a minute to tell the teacher or group or a leader or whoever to say, hey, sorry, pray for me. I'm at a wreck helping out, and I'll fill you in later. I'm leading somebody to Jesus right now. I'll fill you in later, but please pray. And one thing I think about is like when we had the ice storm a couple years ago, I couldn't write um, and submit a very important paper. I had a deadline. And of course, I'm in my area where this crisis is happening, and most of the state was dealing with weather, but not like I was. And so I just picked up my cell phone. I had the instructor's number in my phone. Oh, hey, no problem. I'll tell the district that you'll, I mean, the district, the, uh, the college that you'll be a little bit late on this assignment, and I'll accept it as though you just turned it in this week. And that's just the things that you can do because sometimes God has a plan to do things otherwise. In this particular case, it brought me to my mother's place where a little bit of witnessing went on. Now, the Apostle James talked about the presumptuous uh, things of some of our plans. James 4.13, uh, you see, now my voice is starting to get out. James 4.13 through 15 says, Come now, you who say, Today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are like just a vapor that appears for a little while and then it vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. And we need to be reminded today that our plans may be a little bit presumptuous. Maybe we should leave room for God to change them by saying, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. We should live with the understanding that our plans should be discarded if God guides us in a different direction. Acts of divine providence are God's way of guiding our direction. We should believe that God is guiding our steps. Any changes in the circumstances may be the hand of God redirecting our plans. So interruptions could be redirections in something, something better than we could even plan on ourselves. And instead of being frustrated that our plans have been ruined, we ought to consider the possibility of this divine intervention. We must trust and believe that God guides our steps. Psalm 37, 23 says, The steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. To believe this promise means we believe God is guiding our steps and delights in walking with us in these new adventures. The Samaritan changed whatever plans that he had. And we are not told what the Samaritan was doing before or after what he was doing or going or anything. But we do know that he set aside his plans to prioritize the victim's needs. Rarely are we really strolling along with nothing to do looking for victims. What usually happens is something happens suddenly. So one of the things we have to do is sometimes prioritize the needs of the neighbor. Because we all have needs. Like I mentioned to you earlier, we all have laundry that needs to be done. And we all have something we want to do with our time. You know, sometimes I just want to relax and not be bothered. And it's not that time to not be relaxed and bothered. I should be doing something. But when providence takes us into a needy situation, we ought to change our priori priorities in response. Helping the needy always means a change in priorities. The Samaritan changed his priorities when he saw the needs of the victim. That was what Jesus was commending the Samaritan about. His love was for his neighbor, and so he changed his priorities. Love your neighbor as yourself means prioritizing your neighbor's needs as much as you prioritize your own. So do whatever glorifies God in the name of Jesus. And Paul taught the Colossian believers a principle that applies to many situations. And that principle is our primary verse that I read at the beginning of this message, Colossians 3.17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. 
our words and deeds are to be done in the name of Jesus for the glory of God and the Father and with an attitude of thankfulness to God. So what does it mean to serve in the name of Jesus? It means we are serving in the place of Jesus, in the way that Jesus would serve if he was physically here right now. Serving in the name of Jesus could be reflected in how we serve. Colossians 3.23 reads, Whatever you do, do your work heartily, as for the Lord rather than for men. That word heartily means with all of your heart. Our service to others is also our service to God. That service is to be done with a good attitude and reflecting on how much we love the Lord and how much we care for others. When we serve in the name of Jesus, we are putting his fingerprints on our actions. We are serving with his hands and feet as he would do it. When you and I help our neighbor because Jesus has called us to love them, we bring glory to his name. Now, religious duty cannot be an acceptable excuse for ignoring the needs of our neighbor. That's kind of what the priest and Levite were doing. Our choices are not usually between good and bad, but good and best. The good can become the enemy of the best. The best is following God's new direction, not sticking with our previous good direction. The priest and Levite might have been committing to doing some good religious duties. Maybe they thought their calling to be a priest or Levite was fulfilling God's plan and performing their religious duty to God. But Jesus did not agree with that. Their good became the enemy of their best. Helping their neighbor was their best religious duty. Sometimes following God means interrupting other good religious duties. Jesus commended the Samaritan for changing his plans and his priorities, getting off his animal and making the personal sacrifice to bind up the wounds of the victim. We all commend the Samaritan and admire his actions, but Jesus didn't stop there. He said, go and do likewise. And that's where the story kind of gets personal with all of us, especially with me this week. We're not, no longer talking about a, a Samaritan a few thousand years ago. We're talking about you and me today. Jesus said, go and do likewise, and he's talking about you. Jesus said, go and do likewise, and he's talking about me. Jesus said, go and do likewise, and he's talking about our church. Jesus is commanding us to engage our neighbor in his name. And um, you might have noticed at the beginning of this message that the slide we were had were just like this one where it says, um, good excuses, staying nimble. That was the opening slide. And I really didn't know what to talk about it, so I really just <laughs> left it on the screen. I'll do that sometimes when I'm studying or what God puts in my heart. I'll just put notes in there and change it later. Sometimes I get in trouble because I forget. In fact, this morning when I was going over it again, I left three certain slides in there from last week. I think I need to stop focusing on my own plan all the time. But I originally left it up there a bit, and then as I figured out, I basically decided to leave it on the screen at the beginning of the message, so maybe in the back of your minds you would do the same thing as I delivered the message, just have that staying nimble thing in the back of your mind. Because really, the takeaway from this message is not so much what reasons or excuses you are, I may have. The takeaway is really to stay nimble, to become a blessing to others. And the definition of being nimble is to be quick and light in movement. You know, like the whole Jack be nimble, Jack be quick story. But it also means moving with ease, being agile, active, and rapid. Basically, this means to be ready to act as the Colossians 3.17 verse that I mentioned at the beginning, that whatever we do in word and deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Now on Wednesday, I went over for a, an appointment, um, for a doctor's appointment, and I was, as I just got onto the 405, I noticed right off to the side there was this tree on fire, and you can tell it was a tent that was engulfed. Mm -hmm. And I was going, boy, if that tree is burning that well right now, and we've gotten this much rain, when's it gonna be like in summer? And so then I, I thought all to myself the whole time I'm at the appointment, geez, I'm gonna get on YouTube and see what the story about is that 
I didn't think about actually stopping to see if somebody called to see if anybody's inside the tent or getting hurt. But one thing I did when I got onto YouTube is I found this video, and uh, bear with me because it's a very uh, convicting and emotional video to me. Um, basically, the video uh, showed this guy sitting in his car with his friend, and there was this homeless man sitting up against a building. Mm -hmm. And so this guy was filming to see what this homeless man would do if he dropped something in front of him. So you see his friend videotaping him as he goes and walks by the homeless man and drops $100 right there in front of him. You see the guy keep walking and they see the homeless man on media and go, yeah. just like that. And he, he looks up and goes, it's like, really? Well, the homeless man actually goes and picks it up and he goes, hey, hey. Aww. He tried to call out the guy, but he didn't turn around. This is all part of the deal. This was something that this guy meant to do. And so then they followed to see what the guy would do. And that's what I thought. I want to know what these people do with my money when I give it to them. So you see the guy take the $100 and go into the Dollar Tree. I'm going, that's a lot of things to buy in the Dollar Tree. And I'm going, maybe he's an uh, uh, unhoused individual that knows how to budget. That's what I originally started thinking. Now he comes out of there, he takes everything and puts it all in one bag. And he starts walking around the community to give it to people. Wow. Not just the other unhoused people, but people who look like they had what they needed. Yeah. And so he, this homeless man, his bag gets empty, walks all the way back to the store where this first happened. So the guy gets out again and comes up to him. Hey, did you see my money earlier? And he goes, yeah, man, I took it. I spent it. He started confessing to him about it. And so the video guy goes, uh, what was the point? You could have done anything with it. And this is what the unhoused guy goes, I would rather help people. Wow. Mm. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Amen. I would rather help out people in life because I know how it is out there. Mm -hmm. Because people pass you up all the time and don't care. Mm -hmm. And people start giving up on themselves, giving up on life. But sometimes all it takes... It's just one person to show a person that life is worth something. Yeah. Just one person can make the difference in life. And one thing I noticed is I can't tell if these people knew God or not. Their actions were that of, if you could tell by the fruits of the Spirit, that they probably did not know God. Yet they're doing that. And I, as a Christian, am not. And that's not God's plan. When I watched that video, this is when I realized that that person was the Samaritan, mm -hmm. and I was the Levite and the priest. Mm -hmm. And how much more can maybe we also look up this? Because after that, we go to Victor Rico's the other night. Actually, I go to Victor Rico's and go through the drive-through. I mean, literally, if you've ever been to Victor Rico's. And driving in the drive-thru, there's this set of bushes, and you have to corner around. Right there in the bushes is sleep, somebody sleeping with their face facing out. And as I'm in the drive-thru, I'm going, what am I doing? I start to come around, and I was just thinking, well, should I or shouldn't I? I'm still doubting. Yet yeah, here's another couple that got out of their car and walks over to this lady to help her out. I'm going, how many community programs are we involved with where I don't really even get the same thing of I'm preaching up here? And, need to really start thinking about that sometimes. Now, like the unhoused over here, I'm doing what I can to help them out and working with services. That's good, but how much more could I do? How much more am I going to be the Samaritan or am I going to be the Levite priest? And that's one thing that really I've been thinking about. Now, one thing I have to ask us all, what should our response be? And that's when you can move to the prayer slide. Now, therefore, Mia, um, I, I try to give him notes, and sometimes I forget where I'm at. And so I throw a poor guy off. He does such an awesome job. One of the things that we can all ask ourselves is, uh, is our plans flexible enough for Jesus? Are we doing what we can to prioritize our neighbor's needs as much as we prioritize our own are we making excuses or are we glorifying God in our actions? 
Maybe today we all need to consider how we can go and do likewise. And together, let's just not make up excuses. Let's all go do what the Samaritan did. Let's be nimble and go do likewise, all in the name of the Lord. I'm going to pray for you. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing this conviction message, just especially to me. And I pray if it's on the hearts of other people too, that you just speak to us through this message. I, I pray it's just upon his heart, our hearts, to you could teach us also what we need to go and do, because I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I don't know what to go and do. But you ask us to go and do likewise. So I know when I get into the word, I can see, see many biblical examples of what we're supposed to do. And I pray that this word is implanted on every soul that's in this building today. And we continue to read this word so it just, just gushes out of us to it reaches other people. So we know what to do. And sometimes, like me, I, I have physical problems where I can't do everything, but I know people who can. And so there's things I can do to help. I pray that's just implanted on me to do what I can and not just make my own plans a priority. And I pray that for everybody in this room as well. But I also praise you, God, for your redemptive purpose for dying on the cross for us so we can make things right with you and just move on from there. We don't have to live in the past of what I didn't do or what he or she didn't do. We can move forward in what you want us to do. And I praise you, God, for that. I thank you so much, Lord. Bless this day, Lord, and, and um, let us every day think of what we could be doing for people, whether it's in our family, whether it's a complete stranger. I praise you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. Amen. Um, the song that I thought of today really spoke not just again to this Easter to Pentecost season, but it really spoke to me in this particular message as well. And you might recognize the lyric as I was going to read just a tiny bit of it before the video. But it says, no guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. Um, this song is Christ alone, in Christ alone. Just love. 
about with excuses is is the fear sometimes and I just love that last lyric here in the power of Christ I stand you know even through my own calling right now I think about I'm here because he equipped me you now there's only one way I can say that is he equips me I can't figure out how I can read or do any of this stuff and so when it comes to helping out the needy sometimes even within our church I have to go Okay, God, what do I do here? But I, I need to make sure that I'm not taking my own plans and it getting in the way all the time. Um, I'd like to leave you with this dead benediction. May the love of Christ be active in your heart, be heard in your words, be seen in your actions, and inform your choices today and all days. Amen. Amen. You are a dismissed for birthday cake. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah.